How you guys doing? Doing well? Good to see you guys. Are you guys to stand up? How many of you guys excited to worship? Amen. Let's pray before we get started. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this morning. We just thank you, God, that you can fill us with joy, God, and only you, because we know this world can so easily pull us down, but if we're rooted in you, if you're our anchor, then we don't have to be worried. We don't have to uh, let our emotions dictate the, our life, but we can let you, God, uh, just give us joy. We can let you fill us with love. And so I just pray that we would be joyful in this place, that we would be ready to worship you, that we could throw off uh, the spirit of heaviness and put on the garment of praise, God, that we can throw off the things that have got us down and that we can just press into you. And thank you, Father, for this place uh, that we can meet as the body of Christ and that we can worship you and, and we can come to you, uh, just come humbly before you. And we just thank you, God, that just every breath, everything that you've given us, God, all the, even to the smallest thing, that, uh, that we can love you and that we can thank you for it because everything is more than we ever need, more than we deserve, God. So we just, we just want to honor you in this place. So we ask for your Holy Spirit to fill us, your Holy Spirit to just rush through this place, blowing out all the chaff, everything that's not of you. And we just want, uh, we want you to purify our hearts and we want to just pour out our hearts to you and worship and in praise. And we thank you, God, for what you're going to do. We thank you for uh, just the love and excitement in this place. And we just want that to continue to grow. In your name we pray, God. Amen.
Think of who he is right now. He's the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. He's our bright and morning star. He's our Savior. He's our friend. Just praise him for all those things. Praise him for being our Father. Take my heart and lay it down at the feet of you who's come. Take my heart and let me know I lift it up to you who's
Just you and me here now. It's only you and me here now. It's just you and me here now. It's only you and me here now. It's just you and me.
Good morning. Is that loud? Is that good? All right, well, I was debating whether or not to read some jokes to you guys. <laughs> yeah? Yeah, I know. I figured once you give a moose a muffin, is that how you say it? <laughs> then they're going to want more. I'm not calling you guys moose. Or is it meese? I don't know. <laughs> but this, mooses, is that it? <laughs> but uh, this one actually is from Belly's grandpa. And he, he told her, and she told me without having to read it, but I'm not going to memorize it. I'm just going to read it for you guys. But I think my dad might have said this before, but he didn't even remember, so <laughs> probably didn't, no. But it says, a pastor was walking past a pet shop one day when he noticed a sign in the window, Christian, Christian horse for sale. <laughs> Being that the pastor owned a large ranch, he was immediately interested and went into the shop. The owner took the pastor out to the back where he saw a beautiful Arabian stallion. He agreed to allow the pastor to take a test run. The pastor grabbed the reins. Giddy up. The horse ignored him. No, no, the, count, the counseled the owner. This is a Christian horse. If you want him to move, you must say, praise the Lord. The pastor did <laughs> as he was told, and the horse started off on a leisurely walk. However, he soon found that the horse would not stop. He, went, he won't answer to woe, said the owner. It's amen. So you guys got it? So praise the Lord is to get him to move, and amen is to get him to stop. So the pastor decided that he liked the horse, so he bought him and took him home to his ranch in the country. He saddled the horse up again and said, Praise the Lord, and went riding into the countryside. Suddenly, the horse saw a rattlesnake crossing the path. Frightened, he reared up and bolted straight for the cliff. The pastor cried, Whoa, but the horse only ran faster. In vain, he tried one word after another. Finally, he remembered the correct command and screamed, Amen. Just as the horse screamed, I mean, just as the horse approached the edge of the cliff, the pastor was so thrilled that his life had been saved, and he raised his hands to the sky and shouted, "Praise the Lord!" You guys knew it was coming, huh? Good job. <laughs> you guys like that one? Thank you, Valley. <laughs> there is this one's not as funny, but I think I'll just read it for, to you guys. One Sunday morning, the pastor noticed little Alex staring up at the large plaque that hung in the foyer of the church. The plaque was covered with names, and small American flags were mounted to either, on either side of it. The seven-year-old had been staring at the plaque for some time, so the pastor walked up, stood beside him, and said quietly, Good morning, Alex. Good morning, pastor, replied the young man. Still focused on the plaque, Pastor McGee uh, Still focused on the plaque. So, and then Alex, Alex asked, Pastor McGee, what is this? Well, son, it's a memorial to all the men and women who have died in the service. Soberly, they stood together, staring at the large plaque. Little Alex's voice was barely audible when he finally managed to ask, which one, the 9 o'clock or the 10.30 service? <laughs> you guys get it? <laughs> All right, that's all I got for you today. But today we're going to be in Romans chapter 4, so you guys can open your Bibles to Romans. And so we're going to look at faith, and more specifically, we're going to look at Abraham's outstanding example of it. You guys know that we're called to be men and women of faith, amen? amen. Men and women of faith like Abraham. But in some ways, we already are, but there's other areas where sadly we're kind of like Abraham's wife, Sarah who scoffed in unbelief. You guys remember that? It was in Genesis 18. And I pray that doesn't have to be true about us any longer. I pray that we can look at Abraham's example and follow that and be encouraged to adjust our lives to whatever the Lord has called us to do in faith. And uh, we're talking with the men this, this uh, not Sunday, this Wednesday. And we're talking about how Israel, I think, it, I believe it's only, they only have 7% of the land that God has called them to have, right? And so they could have 100%. God, that's what God planned. He wanted them to fight for that land, right? And not give it away. But what happened? They feared man. So if we look at this spiritually, it reminds me that we need to fight for our lives. Amen? We need to battle against the schemes of the enemy with the power of the Lord. 
And in due time, we'll be able to look back and realize that we've used our full potential. We use the full 100%, not just that 7%. So how many of you guys have ever said, oh, that kid has potential? Have you said something like that? Or how many have gotten that said about you? Don't raise your hand, but they're like, oh, yeah, you had potential, but your time has waved bye-bye, right, or something like that. That is very sad to hear that, right, because you realize that you're like, oh, man, did I just waste my time? Was I supposed to do this or work harder, right? You start to get all these regrets, but we can buy back the wasted years, amen? We don't have to continue in regret. Joel 2.25 talks about God and how he can restore those wasted years. It was talking about how the locusts took all their land, you know, just ate up their land, but God was able to restore, and he can do that in our lives. So this morning, we're going to be in Romans chapter 4. You guys there? We're going to start in verse 16, and we're going to be studying a lot today. Hopefully, we get all the way through it, Lord willing. So we're going to go from verse 16 to chapter 5, verse 5. So let's pray before we get started. Well, before we pray, the title is uh, More Faith Than You Know. More Faith Than You Know. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you, Lord, that you have great plans for us. You have great plans for this service, too. I pray that we don't pass them by, that we don't, uh, that we don't choose to go our own way, that I don't choose to go my own way in this message, but I just choose to speak your words, God. And so I just pray that you would anoint my tongue and uh, just let your people hear everything that's of you. That if there's anything of me that, that would be canceled out, that they wouldn't hear it, that I won't ever say it again. But I pray, Father, that just your truth would resound. And we just thank you, Father, that this is a place where we can speak the truth, that we can be full of joy because we know the truth. I pray that we don't just keep it to ourselves or just get puffed up or prideful, but I pray that we would give it out and that what we've learned in this place, that we would live it out and teach others how to live it as well. And so I just thank you, God, for this service. Thank you for the beautiful time of worship. And I just pray, just like that last song said, we want to know your heart, God. And I just pray that as we study that we don't miss you, but instead I pray that we find you, God, that we see your heart through your word, and that we don't just get caught up in law or get caught up in the words on the page, but that we would get caught up in you, our creator. And so I just thank you, God, for this time, and we just ask for a blessing upon this time, and, and even the time as we worship after, and as we fellowship, and as we go home and do our own thing, that you would be with us, and that we would continue to walk with you. And in Jesus' my name I pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I was, uh, it's always hard to drink with this. I always feel like the gulp is so loud. How many of you guys can gulp without like making it quiet. How can, I can't make it quiet. <laughs> Let's just say that. <laughs> I purposely did that louder. <laughs> but Romans 4, verse 16. And I'm just going to read to 25, and then we'll go for, from there and see if we get to chapter 5. So, so the promise is received by faith. It is given as a free gift, and we are all certain to receive it, whether or not we live according to the law of Moses, if we have Faith like Abraham's. For Abraham is the father of all who believe. Verse 17. That is what the scriptures mean when God told him, I have made you the father of many nations. This happened because Abraham believed in God who brings the dead back to life and who creates new things out of nothing. Verse 18. Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would become the father of many nations. For God said to him, that's how, my descend, how, that's how many descendants you will have. Verse 19. And Abraham's faith did not weaken, even though at about a hundred years of age, he figured his body was as good as dead. And so was Sarah's womb. Verse 20. Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger, and in this he brought glory to God. Verse 22. I mean, 21. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. Verse 22, and because of Abraham's faith, God counted him as righteous. 23, 
And when God counted him as righteous, it wasn't just for Abraham's benefit. It was recorded for our benefit too, assuring us that God will also count us as righteous if we believe in him, the one who raised Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. Verse 25, he was handed over to die because of our sins, and he was raised to life to make us right with God. Uh, I've, been, I've been so excited to, and well, I've been so amazed just studying about Abraham's faith, you know, just reading about it the past few weeks or the ba- past couple months, and I'm so excited that I get to speak on it this morning. But what's even more exciting is that you all, all of us, y'all, <laughs> no, but all y'all, we get, to, we get to live and walk in the same faith that Abraham did. And I, hopefully I can show you how you have, and I pray that I can encourage you to continue to walk even further in that. Amen? So right now, I want you guys to think about the promises of God. You guys have some promises? I'm not going to call on anyone, but think about all the promises in God's word. Think about maybe the promises that he's spoken to you personally. But think about the greatest one, the one, the promise of new life. And we know that we don't deserve it, right? We sing that song, Reckless Love. I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. But you gave your life away. And I just... Every time I sing that, and every time I think of that, I'm just praising God because we know that it's a gift, amen? Amen. But still, that gift needs to be accepted by us. And God doesn't force us to accept it, but we can accept it through what? We can accept it through faith, amen? How many of you guys know that uh, it's a devotional by Oswald Chambers called My Utmost for His Highest? Yeah? It's a good one. And if you guys don't have it, you guys can just look it up online, and it's free. And there's probably apps for it as well. But Chambers was saying, he said, the Lord never insists on having authority over us. He never says, you will submit to me, or you will accept my gift. Instead, he leaves us perfectly free to choose, and yet he will never say a word. But once his life has been created in me through his redemption, I instantly recognize his right to absolute authority over me. So you see that God gives us a choice, and that choice or that faith, that's not what saves us, right? Don't get confused with that. I'm going to try to show you that faith isn't what saves us. You can kind of think of grace and works. They're kind of similar. I mean, grace and law are kind of the principles And faith and works are the means by which we pursue those principles. So if I'm confusing you, what I'm saying is technically we're not saved by faith, but by grace, right? And I'm saying that we're saved by God's grace. And faith, we all need faith, right? Faith is what allows us to step into that grace and to experience that grace. Amen? So the only way we can receive salvation is by grace through faith. And we've been studying about the Jews, you guys, like in Romans, right? We've been studying about how they've been getting caught up in the works. But this passage here in Romans 4 is saying that grace can't be, uh, can't be gained through any type of works. Amen? So let's look at verse 16 again. It, this one really shocked me. The first verse it shocked me because it says, And we are all certain to receive it whether or not we live according to the law of Moses. And so when I read that for a second, I was like, oh no, people are going to think that they can live like the devil and still be saved. I'm like, God, why are you putting this in here? But no, it's true, right? This is good. And in the context of it, we see before and after, that's not what it's saying. It's not saying that you can just live like the devil and then continue uh, saying that you're saved. But it says, look at the words that follow. It says, if we have faith like Abraham's. So... If you have faith like Abraham's, your relationship with God, that's going to be pretty close, right? I mean, I mean it's not going to, it doesn't mean that he's the most, the most perfect man on, on earth. But that's, that means he's not going to be living like the devil and have, saying that you can have true faith in God while you're living in such a sinful life, right? So God gave him a son. Think about him. He gave him a son at 100 years old. That's crazy. But it was a promise from God. And then what did God say? We're not going to study this today, but what did God say to him after he had that promised son? 
God told him to go up to the mountain and to sacrifice his son. And what did Abraham do right then? It was his beloved son, but the next day, the next morning, it says early next morning. Like how many of you guys would wait a little bit, right? <laughs> but he went early, you know, straight up into the mountain to obey God. And you know that it's not like Abraham hated his son or anything. <laughs> it's, not, it's not like, oh, son, let's go. We got to go. <laughs> it's not like that. But it's because he obeyed God and he loved God even more than that precious son to him. And we read that in Genesis 22. But God is so good, amen? We know that God stopped it. God intervened and he provided. He didn't just stop it, but he provided a ram. And so that shows immense faith on Abraham's part because it's not like God told Abraham that he was gonna stop him and provide a ram. No, he just had to take those steps in faith. So if you guys are taking notes, uh, I, if you guys know me, I like to ask a lot of questions. But so some of my notes are just questions for you guys to think, think on. So the thing is what, my question is, what is the thing that you love most dearly in this world? And then the follow-up is, are you ready to lay it down before God? So think about that. What's something like Abraham's, Abraham's son? You know, that special promise so we dealt with a situation recently and it was where a friendship had to be laid down and it was hard, it was very hard, but this person loved God more and I was so proud of them for it. But that wasn't even the hardest part. They faced you know, other things from other people too, but that person continued strong in the Lord. Why? Because they want to make everyone mad? No, it's because they want to please the Lord, amen? So no relationship, possession, or anything should come before God and come before his truth. And so, you know, that's what, that's what you want to say in every relationship that you have. You know, every person that is so close and so dear to you, you want to make sure that you guys are leading each other toward God and not putting each other in front of God. You know, sometimes I picture, like, all our devices, you know, look what we got here. We got a tablet here, we got screens here, you got, everyone has a smartphone basically, you know, you guys have tablets taking notes on, you know, maybe you play video games, you, all these devices, I kind of, I picture them sometimes as little idols, you know, and I do that just to help me realize that those things should never come close to God, you know, they should never come before him, but they should never even come close to being before him, Amen. Let's look at verse 17. That is what the scriptures mean when God told him, I have made you the father of many nations. This happened because Abraham believed in God who brings the dead back to life and who creates new things out of nothing. So we see that God blessed Abraham because of his faith, amen? And so, uh, I don't even know what, oh, okay, so yeah, this is my next question. Do you believe God? It's simple, right? Yeah, that's a simple question. But do you believe that he brings the dead to life and that he creates new things out of nothing? Amen. So Abraham and Sarah, you know, if you take the analogy, they were dead, you know, physiologically. Like they couldn't have a baby. But God promised them a son. You know, I think it was probably when Abraham was in his 80s. And then at 100, he experienced that promise. So he had to wait some time, right? He had to still wait. But he believed that God could bring their deadness, you know, their physical bodies back to life. And he was blessed for it. And, and you can think about that. I think about that like all those years that go by as he's waiting, he's like, God, I'm just getting older. You know, it's just going to be harder. But no, he, he didn't think like that. You know, I might think like that, but he didn't think like that. But spiritually, we're all dead. We were all dead, amen? But we we're dead in our trespasses and sins, as Ephesians 2, 1 says. But God has called us into new life through Jesus. So verse 18. Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would become the father of many nations. For God had said to him, that's how, my, how many descendants you will have. So I'm going to just give you some more questions. Just bombard you with all these things. But 
Do you believe him even when there's no reason for hope? Do you believe him even when there's no reason for hope? You know the difference between uh, Christian hope and the hope of this world? You guys know? Sometimes like when we, when we use the world's hope, we're like, oh, I hope this will happen. But we're not really sure if it will. You know, we're, we're just like, oh, I hope this will happen. I hope I would get this or get this position, you know, something like that. But our hope can be defined as a confident expectation of the coming good. How many of you guys like that? Confident expectation of the coming good. So all that time that Abraham's hoping, he knows it's going to happen because God spoke to him. Amen? So it's not like he's hoping, like, God, will you come through? I don't know. But he's hoping, knowing that that's going to happen. So that's the difference between the world's hope and our hope. The world quits when all hope seems lost. But we never have to quit. Amen? Amen? So get this. Even if all hope is lost, even if the world is going down the drain, you know, that, and the Bible says that's going to happen, you know, we don't have to lose hope because what does the Bible say? He's preparing a place for us. He's going to save us, amen? And our hope is in Christ and in what he has done. And I love that reminder. How many of you guys love Galatians 6, 9? It says, let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we do not, if we don't give up. So that's the key. You have to have that faith. You and I have to have that faith that never gives up. So verse 19. And Abraham's faith did not weaken, even though at a hundred years of age he figured his body was as good as dead, and so was Sarah's womb. So my next question is, does your faith go beyond your intellect? So what you, what you think, you know, your logic just looking at the world and saying, God, how are you going to do this? You know, if he was using his intellect or logic or what he knew, he would be like, we can't have a baby. We're too old, right? But does your faith go beyond what you see or what you hear around you or beyond your, you know, the physical realm and your senses? And you guys know that we're all created in his image, right? And we see that in Genesis 1, 27. But we're not just physical beings. We have spiritual, a spiritual component to us as well. So that means that we're connected to the spiritual realm. So, you know, things that are happening in the spiritual realm can really affect us. How many of you guys believe that? It's, we're connected to that. And so, you know, we have to live and do our work and be functional Americans. So it's not like we just live in the spiritual but I think we live in the physical way too much, you know, like, and we don't even remember that there's a spiritual realm a lot of times until we're attacked or something, right? But God can do the impossible. He can, uh, he can, you know, one of my questions was, do you believe that the spiritual realm is really, really that important? You know, really holds even more importance than this the realm that we're in, the physical realm. Do you believe that? Yeah. And, and we say that, you know, I say that because I, I believe that in my head, but then I go out and I just focus on the world around me. How many of you guys can humbly admit that that happens to you? Yeah, a few of us, maybe more, more of us than we want to admit. But God can do the impossible. He can raise the dead both physically and spiritually. And we see that that's what he was doing with Abraham. He raised him from the dead kind of physically, you know, he gave him a child, but he also said that he would be, you know, he would be declared righteous, so spiritually too. So he can bring, you know, life to Sarah's barrenness, he can bring life to your marriages, to relationships, and he could bring life to your spirit, you know, he, he could bring life anywhere. And I love what the Bible says about Abraham's faith, it says that it did not weaken, did not weaken. And I admit that my faith has weakened at times. And Spurgeon, how many of you guys know Charles Spurgeon? Yeah. And man, I've just been reading what he's been saying. And he, you know, the way that people talk back then and, and this time, we've lightened, we've lightened up a lot, right? But I think that we've lightened up way too much because people people aren't changing as much. People are th- coming to church thinking that they're okay, thinking that you know, oh, I'm a sinner. Yeah, it's okay. Like, not thinking that they 
as they draw closer to Christ that they're going to change. But this is what he said. He said that ministers and preachers need to be especially strengthened in faith. You know, my dad always says that. He says, our job's not like a handyman or a or construction worker. You know, it's, it's fun, especially for a guy that it feels good when you build something and you can look at it at the end of the day and say, I built that, right? Because you can see it physically. But, you know, as pastors, as, as you guys are ministers too, as you speak to people, you don't always see the physical fruit at first. Amen? But, you know, sometimes I teach. My dad always says, he's like, your faces, what, what's happening? <laughs> you know, he just... He teaches, and he's like, is everyone angry at me or something? Well, thanks for smiling, Rachel. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, it's, sometimes it's like that. We look at the outward appearance a lot of times, but we need to change that. And, you know, maybe, you know, he gets criticized, or I get criticized at the end of service for something we said, even though that wasn't the intention, right? But that's why we all need prayer, Amen. And thank you for praying, the pastor prayer team and everything. Thank you for praying because we need that prayer. And we should never in, engage in those, uh, those doubts. This is what Spurgeon says. He says, Whenever, dear hearers, you catch any of us who are, teaching, who are teachers doubting and fearing, do not pity us, but scold us. <laughs> we have no right to be in Doubting Castle. Pray do not visit us there. Follow us as far as we follow Christ. But if we get into the horrible slaw of despond, come and pull us out by the hair of our heads if necessary. But do not fall into it yourselves. So, yeah. If you, yeah, maybe I'll just, no. You can, yeah, you can pull my hair. It's pretty long. But, yeah, you see the difference in how they talk? Because he knows how serious this stuff is. And that's why I've been praying. I've, I've been praying that, I can present the gospel with authority from God and not with doubt of man. I just read Mark 1.22. It says, The people were amazed at his teaching. It's talking about Jesus. For he taught with real authority, quite unlike the teachers of religious law. So the world is going to try to intimidate you. The world's going to try to intimidate me and try to make us doubt. But we can learn from Abraham, who did not look at the circumstances or the things around him. But he... He focused on God. He focused on God's promises because people were, could have probably laughed at him. You guys know what Abram meant, his name before? It meant exalted father. So he was 75 years old or something. And so he, people were like, oh, what's your name, exalted father? How many kids do you have? None. <laughs> but, and then even better, God changed his name even before he had a son to Abraham, which means what? Father of many nations. So he could be thinking, now people are really going to laugh, right? But he didn't focus on that. The things that we tend to focus on, he didn't focus on that. And so I want you to write this down. Do, do not look at your own limitations. Do not look at your own limitations. We have countless limitations and we can make countless, a countless number of excuses. But if we continue to focus on our problems, we're not going to get anywhere. We're never going to see the promises unfold. We're never going to see what God has in store for us. We got to be like Joshua and Caleb. I just, how many of you guys love Joshua and Caleb? Amen? They're, you know, all the spies, they're part of the spies who went into Israel. They checked out the land. They said it's flowing with milk and honey. There's grapes probably like this big. They had to carry them between two men on a pole. So that, that, this land was thriving, right? But what else did they see? They saw giants. <laughs> giants and that made the people's heart terrified everyone except for who joshua and caleb and so maybe you feel limited maybe financially or physically or spiritually or any other area of life maybe you feel limited but we need to realize that jesus is what he's limitless amen so we could fix our eyes on him rather than our limitations so if we know god's promises from his word then we should never let them go through doubt. You know, we should never have doubt. Philippians 1, 6 says, And I am certain that God, who began the work, the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. You know, there's a lot of stuff that we haven't finished in life. 
But Jesus, he always finishes his work in us. Amen? So Abraham had faith that God could raise his body, right? And that counted him as righteous. But we can also believe this for our lives. Amen? And that's, I know it took a long time coming here, but this is where we get our title for today. It's more faith than you know. So keep that in mind. More faith than you know. It comes up here because our faith, get this, it's every bit as incredible and heavy as Abraham's faith. You know, he believed that at 100, he and Sarah could have a child, and that's amazing, right? Sometimes we're like, wow, that's amazing faith. But we have believed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and that's an even greater demonstration of faith. And let me tell you why. It's because you haven't seen him physically. How many of you guys have seen Jesus physically? Have you touched him physically? Have you heard him physically? No, but you believe Amen? And that's what makes your faith, faith as great as Abraham's. And our culture, you know, tries to mock it. Scientists try to disprove it. You know, people come with their doubts, but that makes your faith all the greater. Amen? Amen. All the greater. So for you and me, that means that we've already exercised faith in the most difficult thing. is just believing in, in God, right? And so if we've already done that, if we've already had that great step of faith, then everything else should be easy, right? Everything, all those other acts of faith shouldn't really compare to that, that big step, amen? So I want you guys to realize that, that you're men and women of faith. Really believe that. Really believe that and realize that because we kind of know it, but we don't, sometimes we don't act like we realize it. How, how many of you guys have heard how they uh, keep elephants from run, running away? Yeah? You guys know? Because you think of a giant elephant, it's, it can be up to seven tons. I think, I think Jumbo the elephant, you guys know him? <laughs> he was the one in the circus, the, was it Bailey and Barnum? Or, yeah? Barney? No, <laughs> Barnum. Is that what? Barnum? Yeah. Oh, okay. I mixed it up. But I've never been to the circus. But, uh, oh, yeah. Not the, not Bailey, Bailey's. <laughs> that was it? Oh, yeah. I guess I have. I lied to you. Sorry. <laughs> no. But, uh, <laughs> but what they do with elephant, you think if you tie an elephant, like, even to a car or something, it could just pull, drag the car, right? Or just break the rope. But what they do is, as the elephant is a baby, they take a stake and a rope and they tie the elephant to the stake and hammer the stake into the ground. And so when the elephant's a baby, it's not strong enough to pull the stake out. So it just kind of accepts the fact that it can't go anywhere. So when it gets tied up, it just stays there, right? So as it gets older, as it gets more, you know, it just gets massive. I think the elephant in, uh, I think Jumbo was 12 feet tall, 7 tons. He's huge. But he, all they had to do to keep him still was take his stake, a 12-inch stake, pound it into the ground, and he wouldn't go anywhere. Is that amazing? But that's because, uh, think about Jumbo. Like I, I, I heard John Corson say this. He said that he, he could take his trunk, wrap it around a tree trunk, and just turn his head and uproot a full tree. Isn't that crazy? But he couldn't escape a 12-inch stake. And so the reason that is is because he bought into that lie that he could not escape. And that's like us Christians today. We have immense faith in the fact that Jesus died and that he rose again. Amen? But it seems like we hardly believe for healing anymore. We, maybe we hardly believe that a friendship could be restored. And I just think that's silly. Because, you know, Thomas, he doubted, and he had to see Jesus. He had to see the holes in his hand. But what, did they, what does the Bible say about us? In John 20, 29, it says, Then Jesus told him, You believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. So that's you guys. Amen? Oh, man, my timer froze. <laughs> I don't know how much time I have left. <laughs> but, uh just says 32 but uh verse 20 let's just keep moving on 
Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger. And in this, he brought glory to God. So think about your life once more. Does your faith waver or does it grow stronger? You know, I'm so used, how many of you guys are like me? You're so used to guarding your heart and lowering your expectations so that you're pleasantly surprised when someone does better, right? How many of you guys are like that, sadly? Yeah. But with God, we can do the total opposite, amen? With God, we can, we can raise our expectations. And so I want you guys just as the body of Christ, write this down. Don't lower your expectations. Keep your expectations high. And that's, that's not when you're talking about the world. You know, it's good to still have high expectations because it makes other people kind of do better and stuff. You know, like those two teachers, you've heard that, that story where there's a, a, a teacher who believes that all their students are really bad students, so so they teach them like that, well, and they switch. And the ones, they told them that these bad students, the teacher didn't know that, but it's a, he said that they're straight A students, right? So it, they had high expectations for them, and they ended up doing better than the other class. But so, you know, don't lower your expectations too much like I do sometimes. But keep your expectations high, especially when dealing with the promises of God and what he's going to do. Amen. And from the world's point of view, that's insane, right? But with God, all things are possible. This is, we're talking about, we're studying the same book that says, you know, that you could just move a mountain with a word. Amen? And so the great thing about God is that he doesn't base things on chance or whatever you want to call it. But when you hear from God, you better believe it. Amen? Because he's, he's, what he's saying is going to come to fruition. And what he's saying, he's never been wrong. He's never failed, and that means we could put 100% trust in his, uh, his voice. So, for you guys note takers, uh, well, before I give you this note, um, how many of you guys know how the enemy can steal glory from God? Yeah, he could do it through giving us lies, right? And when we believe that, when we, in our mind, lose that battle and, and, let, and believe those lies and believe those things, you know, and when we're intimidated by the enemy or when we doubt or fall into unbelief, that's stealing glory from God. So you guys can write this down now. It says, give glory to God by remaining faithful. Give glory to God by remaining faithful. You know, even hold all your thoughts captive because the enemy can get in and win those battles in our head, but we can choose whether or not we let those thoughts stay, you know? I think, I think it was Luther or someone who said, you know, you can't help the birds that go over your head, but you can, you can you know, let them nest or not, right? You can choose whether they nest or not. So don't let them nest. So verse 21, he was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. And I love this because First, there's nothing really in this world that we can be fully convinced about, right? But if you're dealing with issues of God, you can be fully convinced, amen? And I always love the way, I, I love the way that God speaks to Abraham because look, he, he gave Abraham a promise, but he said it as if it were already done. We, you know, we read that in Romans, but there's another place in Genesis 17:5. He said, no longer shall your name be called Abraham, I mean Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you. See that? I have made you a father of many nations. And that's before Isaac was even there, right? But he was so confident. God, God knows what's going to happen, and his promise was true, and it did happen. Amen? amen. And, and that's why he can say it with confidence, because he's God Almighty. Amen? And he stands outside of time. So you guys know that we're stuck in this time-space continuum, right? And then, you know, when we go to heaven and stuff, we'll be with God. But God right now, think about this. God is watching Adam and Eve. You know, my dad said this a couple weeks ago or maybe even longer ago. But when we started Revelation, you know, God is watching Adam and Eve right now. He's telling Abraham that promise He's here with us now, 
He's watching us, and then he sees us in heaven, you know? Isn't that amazing? <laughs> you guys, you, we can't wrap our minds around that, but if those of us who are believers are already in heaven, and the crazy thing is God already sees us righteous because of his son. You guys know we always talk about how he's like the blimp. He can see the whole parade, and how many of you guys have been to a parade, Yeah. We went to a parade on Fourth of July. It was a, uh, it was pretty cool. They said that Harrison Ford goes there, so yeah, yeah. But they treat him like a, a local, so they don't they don't bother him much. So that's nice. But uh, he was there the year before. But we we're in Jackson, and there was a parade. But imagine you had friends on the other street, you know, around the corner, and you saw a, bl- you know, you saw a float that was really cool, and you're excited for them to see it. And that's kind of how God is, like. God tells you a promise here, and he's excited because he sees it being fulfilled in the future, right? And so that's, that's how God is. You know, he's, and it, it's silly. All we can describe it is in a parade. But when I read this verse and see fully convinced, I think to myself, man, there's not a lot that we could be fully convinced in except God and his word, right? You, you can't be fully convinced in people. How many of you guys have had people fail you? How many of you guys have failed people? Yeah. And you, can't, you can't even trust your spouse or your parents or your neighbors. Yeah, you can trust them a little bit, but you can't, not everything that they say, you know, are, are they going to hold to. But the only one we can trust is God, and I'm fully convinced and I'm fully assured that God is going to fulfill his promises. Amen? Amen? So that's another question to ask yourself. Are you fully convinced? You know, you might be able to say it now, but it's good to write this down because in those times when you doubt or when you fear, fear you got to look at these questions and say, am I fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises? And if you're not sure, just think about your prayer life. Are your prayers small? Because if your prayers are pretty small, that kind of shows that you, you believe in a small God, right? But, or maybe you're, you think God is small and that he can't do much so you don't pray at all or you pray with doubt or unbelief. But that's not what God wants, amen? So Abraham's God, I want you, let, want you to know that his God is our God, right? It's not like Hinduism or where, where there's multiple gods, pantheism or, but, we have one God, the same God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the same one for us. Amen? And if we saw that he's, and if we knew that Abraham knew that God is able to perform all his promises, then we could be fully convinced of that too. So verse 22. Oh, before we get there, there's this really good quote just talking about fear and doubt, and, and I just want to read it to you real quick. It's by Max Lucado. You guys ever read his books? Yeah. But it says, The fear-filled cannot love deeply. The fear-filled cannot dream wildly. The worship of safety emasculates greatness. No wonder Jesus wages such a war against fear. You see that a lot, right? He always talks about fearing God and not fearing man. Because it, if you fear God, then everything is going to fall into place. So verse 22, we're going to read to 24. And because of Abraham's faith, God counted him as righteous. Verse 23, and when God counted him as righteous, it wasn't just for Abraham's benefit. It was recorded for our benefit too, assuring us that God will also count us as righteous if we believe him, the one who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. Now look, just... Every time I read stuff like this, I just look how good God is. You know, Veli and I keep saying that, how good God is. And I just, want, I just walked outside the other day just like thinking about how good God is. And I passed by my car. I was like, thank you, God, for a car. You know, just all these things that we pass by, we can be so thankful for. Even the little things. You know, a car is a big thing. But even the little things, like we take it for granted sometimes. We drive it every day. We, everyone has one, it seems like, you know, even though everyone doesn't. But, but we take a lot of things for granted, and we, we can change that. Amen? Amen. Amen. And 
I think, you know, when, when the Bible says just believe or just have faith, how many of you guys are like, what? That, that's all you have to do? Or, you know, our human tendency is to complicate things, right? We say, this needs to be more complicated, but all you need to do is believe. Believe what God said, receive it, and enjoy it. And the key is faith. So raise your hand if you know that Christianity is not based on works. Yeah. Many of us know that we can't earn our salvation. So the, my question is, why do so many of us try to do that? Why, you know, I find myself doing that. I, I find myself, you know, I used to do that before I would prepare a message. Like the week before, try to be extra holy, you know. But I should already be, I should already be close to God, right? It's not like, oh, I have a message, so I have to be extra holy this week. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. You should always, because you're always carrying the gospel of Christ. Amen? So it, we try to earn things through works, but we got to get out of that mindset. Because Christianity is about having a relationship with God. And you guys might ask me why I repeat this so much, you know, why we talk about it in the men's study and everything. Why Romans talks about it so much. But it's because we really need to get it into our heads. It's because we really need to know it and we really need to believe it. So, are you, uh, this one, this phrase kind of messes with my mind at first. But it says, you are as righteous in the Father's perspective as his own dear son. Does that mess with your mind like it does mine sometimes? You are as righteous in the Father's perspective as his own dear son. Wow. So, but if you don't believe me, look at Jesus' work. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.21. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. How many of you guys ever... Uh, ever think that Christianity is kind of like that game of shoots and ladders? You guys, who knows what that game is? Is that an old game? Too old? Yeah, but when you're, you know, you're going up the board, and then if you land on a spot, you go down a shoot, like a slide, but then if you land on a spot to a ladder, it can go up, shoot up, right? But how many of you guys have ever gone to the top? You're almost there, and then you take that long shoot all the way down. Yeah, and and people, you know, Christians, even Christians act like life is that way. But, you know, many religions think like that, but that's not the way, you know. Religions are, religions are about do, 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 you know. We call them do, do, no. But, <laughs> but instead, we need to get a relationship with God through what? Through faith. So just believe it. And the skeptic, how many of you guys have had people who dog faith? They're like, oh, faith, why do you have faith, you know? But one man said this, he says, the whole world believes in faith. He said, you go to a doctor whose name you can't even pronounce that has degrees on his wall that you haven't verified at all. And he gives you a prescription you can't read, right? (laughs) And you take it to a pharmacist that you've never met. And he gives you a chemical or he gives you a drug that you don't understand and he puts it in a bottle that you can't open. (laughs) No. But it's faith, right? People practice faith all the time. But the question is, are you going to have faith in that doctor or are you going to have faith in the one who loves you, the one who's given his only begotten son, his beloved son for you so that we can come into heaven with him? So verse 25, he was handed over to die because of our sins and he was raised to life to make us right with God. So this is the gospel in a nutshell, right? This, this one line, Christ died for our sins, and he was raised up so that we might have life with him forever. And I want to look at Romans chapter 5 real quick because I don't know how much time I have, so I'm just going to move on. But Romans chapter 5 says, Therefore, since we have been made right with God, right in God's sight by faith, We have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand, and we confidently and joyfully look forward 
to sharing God's glory. Uh, imagine that. Think of that. That's what we have, peace with God. And that's some heavy stuff, right? It's like, that, that's, you could trip out on that. No, I'm just kidding. That's, that's, a, that's not a good phrase for church or for anywhere. No, but the flesh is at war with God apart from him. You know, before he saved us, our flesh was raging war with him. We crucified him. We hurt him deeply. But by his grace and by his strength and by his love, the war is over. Amen? And some of you are still fighting that war. You're still fighting against the Lord. Maybe you're struggling with him. Maybe you're even trying to hide from him, even though you know you can't hide from him. And I'm still talking about Christians. I'm not just talking about the world. I'm talking about you who call yourself a Christian. Are you hiding from God? Are you still struggling with him? How many of you guys heard about that Japanese soldier who was found you know, in, this, in this island and he still thought the war was going on? He was found in, I think it was in 72. And that's when my mom was born. He was found in 72. And I think Japan surrendered like in 45 or something. So think of all those years. He thought the war was still going on. So he was stuck away. He hadn't heard the news. He didn't understand that the war was over. And he was still you know, in the j- jungle trying to build fortifications and trying to uh, even fight off the, the elements and stuff around him. But he was ready for someone to attack him all these years. But you think about that, and it's sad, right? You think, what a waste. Just all this time, you're thinking a war is happening, and you're ready for it, but nothing's, there's been peace, you know? And he could have been, <laughs> he could have been, you know, I don't know, never mind. But, I like to bring you these sad stories, right? You guys like these? No. But I like to bring them, not just to make you sad, but I like to bring them because we can use these as analogies to check our lives, to make sure that we're not like that soldier believing that we still have a war or a fight with God. And it's, it's amazingly sad how many believers think that way. They live that way. And it's not really living. It's more like surviving. But you may know people like this. Maybe it's you. Maybe you're thinking, oh, how many of you guys have thought that? Like, oh, I hope the Lord doesn't come and punish me for this or, or get really upset with me or, man, he might, be, he might be mad at me because of the other day of what I did. I better hide or I better not believe. How many of you guys have felt even more unworthy to believe God for something or to ask him for something because of what you've done? I have done that. Even without trying to really think that just just kind of subconsciously but if that's you you don't get it you're like that Japanese soldier stuck in the jungle totally ignorant of the current situation and I know you're not ignorant because I'm telling you but some some people are willfully ignorant but I'm telling you what God says in his word he says it is finished amen it is finished John 19 30 the war is over and we have peace with God and the sins which separated us from him and are forgiven. They're forgotten. And that's because of what Jesus Christ did for you and me. So now we can relax in our relationship with the Father. And there doesn't have to be that battle anymore because of his work. And the Bible doesn't say, doesn't tell us that we're not going to, we're, we're, how many of you guys know that we as Christians are still in a fight, Right? But we're still in a spiritual battle. Like we always say, this isn't a playground. This is a war zone, right? But, you know, the Bible doesn't say that we have peace with the devil or that we have peace with the world or our flesh or with sin. But as a Christian, we're no longer fighting God, but we're fighting with God against those things, against the enemy. So let's pick up in verse 3. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials for we know that they help us develop endurance and endurance develops strength of character and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation and this hope will not lead to disappointment for we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. So I believe our time is almost up but it's great to end on this, right? 
because Christ has done so much for us and now we can experience that through faith. And there's no problem, there's no worry, nothing big enough that our faith can't handle because we've already stepped out in a great amount of faith. And that's why I titled this More Faith Than You Know because you've already taken a great step of faith so I encourage you to continue to give God glory by having faith in even the little things. They might not seem little for you, but have faith. Amen? Amen. And then we look, we look at this. It says, Paul talks about tribulations in this text, right? And he says that, I think it's, yeah, problems and trials. When we run into problems and trials. So those tribulations, that's a strong term. Tribulations, it's not like a minor inconvenience, right? But that's a real hardship. And Paul lived a life full of these tribulations. And he says that we can glory in these tribulations. Because why? It produces endurance. How many of you guys have worked out before? <laughs> yeah? But if, if a runner wants to be a good runner, they have to stress the body. So these stresses produce endurance. You know, if sailors want to be a sailor, they have to go to sea. If soldiers are going to be a soldier, they go to battle, right? And so it's true that tribulation, that's part of our Christian life. And again, these, these amazing men of God, they look at these guys in the old times, Charles Spurgeon and Smith, Smith Wigglesworth. They said, a Christian man should be willing to be tried. He should be pleased to let his religion be put to the test. There, he says, hammer away if you like. Do you want to be carried to heaven on a feather bed? <laughs> so, and then Wigglesworth, you guys like that name, Wigglesworth? <laughs> he said, I've heard people advise others against praying for patience because God will then send them tribulations. If that's the way patience comes then, God, bring on the troubles. I need patience. <laughs> Amen? So these guys were, were intense, and that's how we are to be. We're not supposed to fear the tribulations, because guess what? There's the, new, the truth is that non-Christians experience tribulations as well, but we want to be facing them for the glory of God. And I love that we get to end on verse 5, because it says, and this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us, because he has given us the Holy Spirit, to fill our hearts with love. And I pray that you have that deep inner awareness of God's love. Amen? And it's communicated, which is beautiful, through the Holy Spirit. And it's not a trickle. How many of you, well, don't raise your hand, but a lot of people, you see Christians, and it seems like they believe that God's love is just a trickle. They believe that God's love just comes here and there. But no, God wants to pour his love into our hearts. Amen? He wants us to experience that outpouring, he wants us to know that outpouring of his love. So if you're lacking in that awareness of God's love, it's most likely because you're not consistently be, or constantly being filled with the Holy Spirit. And this is what Guzik says. Sometimes you're like, what? I'm, I'm not constantly being filled. But he says, everyone who is a Christian has the Holy Spirit. And we see that in Romans 8, 9. But not every Christian lives in the fullness of, of the Holy Spirit. And we read that in Ephesians 5.18. And then he, the last thing is he says, and not every Christian walks in the Spirit. And that, and that can be found in Romans 8, 4 through 5. So don't just have the Holy Spirit, but be filled with the Holy Spirit and walk in the Spirit. And walk in faith, amen? Walk in faith. Realize that, I want you guys to realize that you already have more faith than you know. You know, when People, the soldiers go through intense training so that they know what it's like for war, so they're ready, so they're not, they're not you know, afraid. You, know, you can still be afraid, but so that they're prepared. But I want you guys to know that you've already done something great. You've already had great faith, so don't stop there. Don't go back. Don't decrease or weaken your faith, but instead move on. Don't be like Jumbo. <laughs> Jimbo, no. That's from a movie. But Jumbo, don't be like Jumbo who is weakened by the lies, but instead remember the promises of God and have faith that he'll never fail you. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you, Lord, that your promises are true. Thank you just for all your promises. Just, just like we see uh, your prophecies and your word just coming true. Even when people believed, oh, they would never become allies like Russia and all those people that my dad pointed out, but they did. And it, we just see your prophecies unfolding. We see that your promises are true and that you've never failed. So I just pray that we would believe. I pray that we would have faith. We already have faith in you, but I just pray, God, that we have faith that you are still moving, that you are still working, that you're still doing miracles, God. And I pray that our doubt and our unbelief doesn't hinder. I just pray, I know that it does at times hinder, like, healing or hinder things, but I pray, God, that we would get rid of doubt, that we would pray like that man in the Bible, Lord, I believe, help me overcome my unbelief. And so I just pray, God, that we can humbly say that, but that we don't just continue in unbelief, but that we are strengthened in faith. And we just thank you, God, that, uh, that you love us, that we see just everywhere in your word how much you love us and how much you've sacrificed for us so that we might be saved, so that we might be men and women of faith. And so I just pray that as your men and women go out this morning, that they would walk in faith, that they would walk in the fullness of the Holy Spirit, that they wouldn't just know about you or know the truth of your word, but that they would allow it to affect and change their hearts, affect and change their lives. And we love you, Father, and thank you for all that you're doing. It's in Jesus' my name I pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.
Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week.